a warm welcome to this third OCS refresher tutorial. This time we're going to be looking at supply and its close friend transport. How you move logistics around the battlefield and keep everyone happy. We're going to look at first of all how to get trace supply. Trace supply is like the housekeeping uh, supply system that just allows units to be in the field. We're going to look at the specifics around trace supply and what it means to be out of supply. And if you go seriously out of supply, how you might break out of that situation. We're then going to look at the specifics around fuel and then combat supply. And then look at transport, rail and land and air. And then we're going to try and bring that together with a little case study. I've chosen Smolensk. And we're going to look at the campaign start from the Soviet side about how you may assess supply and transport and how logistics are going to shape your activity in the campaign. Getting trace supply. So trace supply is nominal. You don't actually move anything. You just need a line of communication back to usually a map edge, often a rail hex. Sometimes it's an off map box or a port. You can also get it from a detrainable hex on a railway line connecting back to the supply source a village, a city, a port, um, an HQ on its combat mode, all of which needs to be free of enemy zones of control. And you can use an extender, which is a transport unit, a truck or a wagon, a large one, usually a, a five pointer flipped onto uh, its extending side where it doesn't actually move and the going backwards and forwards is again purely notional. Those are the good places where you get supply and if you can't reach them then there are a couple of emergency sources of trace supply. So one is that you can eat off the map which is go get your supply from the other supply system. So trace is one supply system, supply points is a second supply system. And then secondly there are often some game specific rules about what you can do around you know, goulash and sausages and tree bark soup and such like. Because there's this interrelationship between trace supply and supply points, I wanted to create a model where the two got integrated together and ta-da, here we are. Um, yeah, let's break this down a little bit because I think it's a really useful way of conceiving the whole supply situation. So, first of all, you're a unit and you need to draw supply from a supply source. Okay? Or you're a unit and you can draw supply from a detrainable hex uh, along a railway. Or you can draw supply from an extender usually along a road if you want to extend your extending range as far as possible. In addition, you can extend from a detrainable hex to push that even further forward. I very specifically use the words draw and I'll get into definitions of that in a moment. But if you want to push the supply even further forward, you can use an HQ. And the HQ can do the drawing on behalf of the unit and then throw forward the supply using its own throw range, which is this eight. Uh, here are the definitions. So drawing is five truck movement points, or if you're using an HQ, it's the mobility type of the HQ, which is usually truck as well, plus one adjacent hex, which is important. The throw is the HQ's Row range in movement points, again, whatever mobility type it is, and again, usually that's truck, uh, again, plus one adjacent. And the adjacent is, it's like a little get out of jail free card because it's one hex, regardless of anything, regardless of the terrain, even regardless if it's prohibited and you couldn't actually move into that hex. That means that the range here goes from, I don't know, Let's imagine this unit was trying to draw directly uh, across open terrain. It would have a range of five hexes because truck on open terrain costs one usually, and it would have um, one adjacent, so six hexes. If it did that over a road, those six hexes would become 11. 
if it's if it's a secondary road, usually. Game specifics always apply. If you add this throw range in using an HQ, then the HQ can draw 11, but throw 17, 8 doubled up to 16, plus 1 adjacent 17. So combined, that becomes 28 using secondary roads, as opposed to the original 6 using open terrain and not roads. So you really need to use the terrain to your advantage and use the HQs to throw stuff forward to really allow these units to roam as freely as they can. And this is the normal course for trace supply. But if you get into any trouble, there is this second supply system, the supply points that usually are, go and sit in a dump somewhere on the battlefield and are transported by, oddly enough, transports, mules and wagons and trucks and aeroplanes and also ships and landing craft in more marginal rule cases. These supplies usually come from something like a supply table, although sometimes they come from an infinite, unlimited supply box off map, and, and the limit is usually how much can the railroads or the ports handle as they bring these supplies forward. Using supply dumps, you can eat off the map. So if this unit can't get its trace supply from any of these sources, but it can draw from this supply dump, then it's good to go. You could also use this transport here to airdrop some supply directly onto the unit. Again, if you've got an HQ, it can throw the range forward. Now, that would probably be quite a large pocket for that to happen, but that's definitely fine. If you can't eat off the map, you are going to be out of supply. So if none of these are available to you, you are out of trace supply and nasty things will happen. If you go out of supply, you do have the option of attempting to break out rather than facing the attrition that occurs without a supply. However, you really don't want to go squandering these oh-so-precious supply points on something as mundane as eating off the map. You've got a load more interesting things to do with these supply points. They can stock internals, more of which in a moment. They are crucial for supplying your combat, both attack and defense, for supplying your barrages, for fueling up your tracked and truck-born units, for building facilities like air bases and hedgehogs, and for refitting aircraft on air bases. All of this is really crucial and important stuff. And again, you can do this by drawing supply from the uh, supply jump, or you can have an HQ come along and let that do the drawing and allow that to throw forward. Finally, if you are in need of combat, uh, but you can't, for whatever reason, reach to a supply dump, you can use internal supply. Uh, it's for combat only, attack and defense. It's not for barrage or any other use. And really, that's supply in a nutshell. Yeah, it is quite complex, um, but it allows for an enormous amount of flexibility uh, and imposes enough constraints that you can't just rush off anywhere doing anything. It also means that you really, really, really do need to protect your re areas because if you get your trace supply lines mucked up, you're in serious trouble. And if you get your supply dumps overrun and potentially captured, you're in serious trouble too. There is literally never a time when you have an super abundance of supply so guard it. Finally, there are often game-specific rules around supply, the Third Winter, DAC that I'm going to be playing soon. So do check those closely for what they have to say about supply. Trace supply and out of supply. So combat units only, so non-combat units don't have to worry, gets trace supply in the supply phase, unsurprisingly. There's an exception, which is airdropped units 
do not need to trace supply on, on the first turn that they land. If you go out of supply, you can't attack and your defense is halved. However, it doesn't impact on barrages. Your movement is normal, but you don't have a zone of control if you thought you normally had one. And you will have to roll on the attrition table per stack. Um, it crucially uses your action rating and you ignore any um, disorganized minuses to your action rating on this. The results are, you know, reasonably alarming and get more alarming the worse your action rating. If you have things in a big stack, they will attrit slowly. You can eat off the map, as we've discussed. One token feeds two REs rounded up. Um, if you've forgotten, supply points come in points and tokens. One supply point is four tokens. So one of those tokens will feed two REs, half a division, a brigade, a couple of battalions. You can't eat off the map if you are in strat mode, but then if you are in strat mode, you really ought never to be in a situation where trace supply is in a, an issue because strat mode is for moving around the rear. Extenders, as we've discussed, extend your supply lines forward. They take a truck or a wagon that would be scuttling around the battlefield, moving supply points, flips them over and instead extends the range of trace supply. Um, it draws that place trace supply up to this range, 10 and 20 movement points, truck movement points and leg movement points. Uh, you can daisy train extenders. So an extender can extend an already existing extender. If you don't need your extender anymore, you can flip it back to its five transport movement side and it's good to go. Or if it's been rushing around, it can move up to half of its movements allowance and then flip to be an extender. You can also use extenders to join up to railway lines, but you can't do rail transport a little bit on rail and then across on the extender and then a little bit more on rail. If an attack capable unit uh, enters the extender's hex, the extension is collapsed and it's flipped to its transport side and it's placed somewhere within this 10 or 20 uh, movement factor range. If you're out of supply, you can accept the slow whittling down of your force through attrition, or you can attempt to break out. So long as it's a combat unit and it has some movement allowance, it can break out in a special breakout segment in the sequence of play. The conditions are slightly strangely worded in the rules. So the way I th think of it is you have to do two things. The third, actually the second one is that you need to be able to see a friendly unit in trace supply within 15 hexes. Um, just by line of sight, ignoring enemy zones control, you know, effectively you can't be cut off so far away uh, that you can still break out. It has to be within 15 hexes of friendly forces. Next, you need to have a trace path that's possible. Using your move mode movement points, so you could be leg, could be leg on one side, truck on another, those sorts of things. But in your move mode side, whatever mobility type that is, you need to be able to trace, trace a path of any length, so long as it doesn't have any enemy units there, or doesn't have any prohibited terrain, or if your movement mode is a truck, it doesn't have any zones of control. So this one is, you need to be able to trace a theoretical path. And this one is you need to be able to see friendly unit within 15 hexes. Transports can also break out along as combat units. And if these conditions are met, then you roll one dice per unit, including one dice per transport. You get a plus one on your first attempt to break out, but it's pretty punishing. On a one to four, 
you fail and you go off to the dead pile to be rebuilt if you're rebuildable. On a five or six, you get success and you're removed from the map and then you roll a third dice and that will determine how many turns in the future you'll come back as a replacement. If you come back as a replacement, you lose all your markers, but you do retain your step loss if you had any. So it's a bit desperate. If you think that you can be rescued from encirclement, then you're probably better off with attrition. And if you think they'll never be able to rescue you from encirclement, well, breakout is a last desperate roll of the dice. But if you do it in the first turn, you at least have a 50-50 chance. Otherwise, it's a bit bleak. Fuel supply. Leaving trace behind and looking at what you can do with these supply points, fuel is crucial for any tracked or truck movement units. They all need fuel. Without them, they don't move. Reinforcements that are track or truck don't need fuel to be placed in an entry hex, but to move from that entry hex, yes, they do. They don't just get free fuel coming on the map. Fuel is not needed for any of these things. You fuel in one of three ways. A multi-unit formation, a panzer division, a tank division, a tank corps, use one supply point to fuel the entire formation, all those little itsy bitsy brigades and regiments within the formation. And that fueling stays good until the next friendly cleanup phase. And if, uh, if you pop things into reserve, that gives you that whole thing of the enemy's turn and then your turn, and then finally your cleanup phase. Secondly, you can fuel an HQ and it can then fuel up all the track and truck units within its throw range that aren't part of a multi-unit formation. So all those little itsy bitsy uh, battalions and regiments that uh, assist your combat units. And then finally, you can fuel an independent unit alone for 1T, quarter the amount of um, the two biggies. Now, this is regardless of the size or the number of steps in that unit, and it lasts only to the current phase. If you get an old-style uh, Russian tank division, for example, that is just a division with steps, it's not a multi-unit formation with individual uh, brigades or regiments or battalions in it, then it fuels as a single independent unit for one T that lasts for one phase. This can both be cheaper if you just want it to do a little bit, but also more expensive if you wanted it to move in several phases. Finally, if a unit from a multi-unit formation gets separated from the rest of the formation, as in outside the throw range of the HQ, then it has to be treated as an independent unit. I mean, the most common situation of this is that it's come on as a reinforcement. Combat supply is the other primary use of supply points, with the exception of barrages. It takes one token per step to make an attack. So attacks can get pretty expensive. You know, a four-step German infantry division with no step losses would take uh, an entire supply point, four tokens, to attack. A multi-unit formation, a panzer division, may easily take six to attack. Um, slight exception in DAC, a two-step brigade, British brigade, Commonwealth brigade, I should say, uh, also just takes one token. In defense, it takes one token to defend if you are one regimental equivalent or less. So if you are just a regiment or a battalion. Otherwise, it will take two tokens to uh, defend. Regardless of how many steps it has, 
So say two four-step big fresh German infantry divisions are being attacked, well, they'll just take two tokens. If you cannot reach a supply dump to pay for this, either directly drawing to a supply dump or having an HQ throw to you from a supply dump, then you'll have to use internals. Internals are two levels. So you get your unit, not used internal, fresh. Then you use an internal supply and you get a, a low marker. And then you may have to use a second internal supply and then you get an exhausted marker and then you can't use internals anymore. Using internals means you don't have to pay these, which is great, but you do have to pay them back later and they're expensive. They cost two tokens per level. So two tokens for exhausted, two tokens for low to restock them per step. You know, for a four infantry division, that's eight tokens to bring up a uh, one level of internal combat supply, which is ouchy. Often people only use internals when they think there's no hope for this unit surviving. So you have three systems there for trace supply, side points and internals, and they have different consequences for how well you can attack and defend. So you've got trace supply and you can reach to supply points. You're good. You can't use internals at all, but why would you? Because you can attack in full and defend in full. If you don't have trace supply, but you can get combat supply from supply points, again, you're not allowed to use internals. And now you can attack and defend only at half. If you do have trace supply, but you can't get uh, on map supply from supply points, you can use internals. It's optional. You don't have to, and you don't have to because of this high restocking cost. But if you do use them, then again, you are at full attack and full defense. If you're not in supply from trace and you're not able to reach any supply points and you decide to use your internals, then like here, you are attack and defend at half. If you're not in supply, not able to reach supply points, and if you choose not to use your internals, you cannot attack and you defend at water strength. If you can reach trace, but you can't reach supply points and you are exhausted, um, you've used all of your internals. Again, you cannot attack, but you can at least defend at half strength. And finally, if you have no trace and you have no ability to reach supply points and you're exhausted, then you can't attack and your defense is at a quarter. I said that internals can't be used if there are supply points. That doesn't include any supply points on organic trucks. They are separate and not counted. The other thing to note is that if you're disorganized, you will get a further halving of both attack and defense and a minus one on your action rating as well. So for example, this no trace, no supply points, exhausted from your internals and you're disorganized, this one quarter would go down to one eighth or shafted, as is probably the technical term for this situation. Quite a few variations to have to consider. We have a look at transport now. First of all, rail. So rail is obviously the network of railway lines across your map and rail capacity. And the size of your rail capacity is set in your game specific and or scenario rules. And rail capacity is on the same equivalence as supply points and regimental equivalents or steps and transport points. So one rail cap is the same as one of any of these. Uh, transports can go loaded or unloaded on there and use their rail capacity. So they kind of go for free. 
If you travel only on multi-track railway lines, then the rail cap cost is halved. If you go through train busting zone from an air attack, then the rail capacity cost is doubled. So it would cost one SP two rail capacity to move through a train busting zone. Obviously, if the train busting zone was also on a multi-track railway, it would cost half as doubled. So it would go back to normal. If you are transporting a leg unit, which in move mode has a movement allowance of six or less, then that costs only half a regimental equivalent. All other combat units cost the full RE. Movement consists of entraining, movement, and detraining. Entraining is done at a detrainable hex. It has no zones of control anywhere. You, if you're a combat unit, are in move mode and it costs you half of your MP uh, movement allowance to entrain. You then move again through no zones of control, and this occurs only in the movement phase, and then you detrain in a detrainable hex and move no further. You can convert railway lines between different gauges. This is, you know, East Front really. And there's a pile of specific rules about that. They are similar to the rules that you see for some games where you build a railway line. For example, in DAC, the Allies extend a railway line from Mercer Truth up to Trebuk, I think. Um, and there are other game specific rules uh, around this kind of thing, but they follow this similar pattern. Land transport, mules and wagons and trucks, uh, uh, including organic trucks, have a point size. Here you can see their size is one, two, two and one. And they can only carry supply points. They can't carry other units. They load supply points at 10% of their movement allowance rounded. So 10% of 45, for example, is five and they unload supply points likewise at 10% of their movement allowance. And they unload this to an existing dump or a combat unit or a port or an airbase. You can't just willy-nilly drop off supply points unless it's covered in the uh, game specific rules. There's no limit to the number of supplies you can have stacked, but you know, make sure you garrison it. They have no reserve, no strategic movement, combat, exploit, or disorganized statuses as transports, except for organic trucks can be in a stack uh, in reserve, for example, and get tagged along with that. They can be carried, as I said, by rail, loaded up. Organic trucks never unload their supply points, so you can't use organic trucks as normal trucks to run round supply points. They are only for their formation and they use directly from the organic truck. Uh, they usually, well, they arrive as reinforcements loaded up with supply, which is nice. They can be in reserve as said. They can tag along for a retreat, um, so long as they're not alone. If they're alone, they get captured. They can convert if captured to a normal supply point on the enemy side and you can have an organic truck and then have your HQ and then have your HQ throw the supply point on your organic truck forward to the rest of the units in your formation. Destruction and capture shouldn't happen if you're properly guarding your re area, but you know, stuff happens. So if an attack capable enemy unit enters a supply dump, you roll a dice, for each type, so a roll for supplies at the dump, a roll for trucks, a roll for wagons. Capturing is given as a percentage uh, down here on the table. Supply points remaining are destroyed. So here you capture 25% of the supply and the 75 supply remaining gets destroyed. For trucks and wagons, the percentage is what you capture. And then anything that's not captured is displaced 
10 hexes for trucks and 5 hexes for wagons away. You can move captured transports in the movement phase that you captured them, if you captured them in the movement phase, or in the next one as normal. Air transport. Air transport transports cargo. Cargo is both supply points or supply tokens, usually, and its regimental equivalents. And they can fly in any movement segment uh, and then eventually become inactive in this air transport mission. If you fly half range, so here if you flew 133 hexes, then you would double the capacity of your transport and return back to an airbase. So you'd fly out to a destination, drop your supply, drop your REs, and then go back and become an active. If you are flying a transport mission at normal range, then you just take whatever the capacity is. So here 1T, fly to a destination, and then fly back and become inactive. If you fly at double range, so here you'd be flying out to 532 hexes. That's fine. You unload your supply or your RE, and then you become inactive at that extended range uh, destination airbase. You can combine aircraft to carry heavier loads if they're at the same airbase. So here, this Heinkel 111 and uh, integral glider has a capacity of half a T. And this Yonkers 52 also has half a T of capacity. So you could combine them together and carry an entire supply token so long as they are at the same airbase. If fighters intercept these two on this combined mission, um, you would lose cargo uh, proportionately. You round these losses in favor of the cargo's survival. So if you lost one of these two and together they were transporting one T, the one T would survive. Supply points cannot move after uh, or before being transported. Unloading is at a rate of two tokens, which is half regimental equivalent, per airbase level. So a level four airbase could unload eight tokens or two REs. Above this limit, they can still unload, but they must become, the aircraft must become inactive. Supply points can't move, but combat units can move and can fight with air transport. But it depends on what phase and what segment you're in. It depends whether you're not in reserve or you were in reserve, but you're being released. And it depends whether you can afford to overrun. So in movement mode, in the movement segment, if you're not in reserve, you can move half your movement allowance and then have air transport, or you can have air transport and then move half your movement allowance. If you were in reserve and they're being released because, I don't know, it was for deterrent effect and you want to put the reserve marker somewhere else, well, the same applies. And yes, you can overrun and pay the three movement points. In the reaction phase, in its movement segment, uh, if you're not a reserve, well, then obviously you can't move at all. You, you can be air transported if you're on an airbase and then go to another airbase. If you were released from reserve, then you have the half halved again. So you can move quarter of your movement allowance if you are released in reserve in the reaction phase. And again, you can overrun, although you might be running short of uh, movement points. In the combat phase, you can uh, obviously have combat if you're not in reserve, and obviously not if you are in reserve. In the exploitation movement phase, you again can't move, but if you're on an airbase, you can be flown to another airbase and again not moved. If you were in reserve, then you can move half of your movement allowance before or half of your movements after, or indeed like quarter a bit before and a bit after. And again, you can overrun. And in your exploitation phase, if you weren't in reserve, well, and you were moved by air transport, well, you can still defend, that's fine. And again, if you're a released reserve, 
then yes, you can uh, attack or defend. That's fine. Obviously, in combat, things like advance after combat and retreats, they're not movement, so they're not subject to any of this kind of stuff. Mules can be carried loaded with supply points. Finally, combat units can be carried in air transport as cargo if, in their move mode, they have a movement allowance of six or less. So just small infantry units, no other combat units. Air landing is similar to air transport, but whereas air transport is air base to air base, air landing is air base to any old hex, pretty much. Two types, air drop. So you fly to a hex and return during the movement phase only. Um, that's the only time this mission can be done and become inactive. You can carry a supply point or a specifically marked parachute unit, or if you're using a glider, any combat unit as per air transport. So the, the six movement allowance in move mode. You need a drop plan for combat units, not supply points. Um, you can just do off the cuff. It needs to be in writing two turns ahead or at the start of the game. You have to state which hex the unit's going to land in, and you need to do this planning during the refit phase. No unit can be in more than one plan, so no if, but, oh, well, we could go there. No, none of that. One plan. And um, plans can be delayed a turn and then delayed another turn, or they can be cancelled in the refit phase, and then you start doing a new plan that will come into force in two turns from now. The airdrop procedure is to resolve the flak, uh, resolve the air transport success table on here with two dice per unit or one token and add any of these mods. If you succeed, you land, and if you fail, you're destroyed. So you can see you destroy, um, you know, quite often, uh, even with these uh, mods. Once you've landed, there's no movement for combat units, but they can have combat afterwards. So it is pretty simple. It's a bit scary, quite a high failure rate. Glider stuff adds plus one mod, which is helpful. I'm treating glider rules as kind of game specific. I know they're in the core rules, but they only turn up in a few games. So that's supply and transport. Let's have a little think about how this can be applied using Smolensk as an example. So here's the campaign set up for Smolensk. You really need to read the game specific rules. There are 68 references to supply in the game specific rules for both sides. The Soviets get their supply primarily from a supply table and they have a, an early and a late phase. The early phase is before the 19th of August and the late phase is oddly enough afterwards where supplies become significantly shorter in supply. You can see using the rule of seven that the most average result is a nine and a five. You can place one supply point in a city a detrainable hex for free. The rest have to come on the map edge. The detrainable hexes are here. So the city ones I've marked in black, the red ones are, are detrainable hexes that aren't. And if I sort of do this a little bit, you can see them flashing and you can see actually there's a heck of a lot of detrainable hexes throughout the map. So you should be fine for loading uh, and unloading your supply and moving it around as you need, and you should be fine for trace supply. The map edge is full of supply sources. These are either D for dual track or S for single track railways or R for roads. But as you can see, there are a lot of them. However, some of them do become unavailable. So from the 19th of July, this northern dual track railroad going into Vitebeska, that's not going to be available anymore. More importantly, these four down on the southern edge of the map are not going to be available from the 19th of August. Supplementing the rail network and the road network is a roll on the special replacement table. And if you roll one or two, you get a division, but hold your breath, 
The division has one step loss, and it only started with two steps to begin with. Uh, and you get a cash. You start with two caches. The caches are able to either give you two T's worth of barrage. You can use both of your car uh, caches for a stunning four token uh, barrage. Or more usefully, it can put an entire HQ and all the units in its throw range into trace supply for that turn. So I don't know, if you happen to have an encircled army, that could be pretty useful. But you've only got a one in three chance of that happening. Otherwise, you get one of these useless divisions and one of these alarm units that the Russians have. There are also these two boxes, the northeast and the north southeast box, uh, they allow you to go off map for uh, no cost at all, and then return a turn later for one MP. So you can go off D or R down here, uh, and then return over here. If, for example, you know that these are all going to disappear on the turn before the 19th of August, you can use your units to go off the map into your southeast box and then have them reappear either down here or up along your eastern edge, which is pretty useful, having only uh, spent one movement point. So the consequences of all this is that your supply situations as the Soviets is not great. You get 12 turns where you get this slightly better early supply, and then seven turns where you get this later poorer supply, plus a few scraps from this special replacement table, plus what you start with on the map, plus a few bits of reinforcements. The resources at start is that you have a rail capacity of two, you have two caches to use, you have 37 supply points, which is, you know, not bad. You have seven wagons and two trucks and a 1T air unit for air to transport. That means on average, you're going to get in the early part nine supply points and a one third chance of a cache and one of these magnificent one RE divisions. So over the 12 turns before the 19th of August, you're going to get a total of 108 supply points on average, you know, if you rolled sevens every time and four caches as well on top of the two that you already have on top of the 37 uh, that you already have. In addition, you're going to get four more wagons, technically five, but you have to remove one, and six trucks, and a further 13 points of supply. And, you know, that's that's kind of your average lot. In the late parts of the campaign, you're going to get five supply points on average. So over seven turns, that's going to give you another 35 supply points on average, and just short of two caches. Um, but you're going to remove four wagons and two trucks as things deteriorate. What does that mean? Well, in reality, if you're spending more than nine slash five supply points during your early and late phase, you're going to have to draw down on this stock of 37, plus the few bits and bobs that you get as reinforcements. This at start supply is almost irreplaceable stock. So I strongly advise that you think about it and use it carefully. Use it for counterattacking with some of the new armies that appear. Save it for the post-August 19 shortage time in the late period when you could really do with a few more supply points. Avoid just using it in penny packets, bolstering each turn. If you did that, you would use uh, another two supply points for the entire campaign, which I don't know, just, just seems like you're frittering it away. Use it intentionally when you really need it and be aware that once it's gone, it's gone. Nine supply points a turn or five supply points for a turn. For reference, nine supply points is 18 uh, defenses or 32 attack steps. 18 defenses, well, I doubt the Germans are going to attack you 18 turns in every turn. I mean, maybe on the first turn, but probably not. But it's not a huge number, and obviously it goes down in the late phase. 
and you've got to pay for fuel and you've got to pay for barrages and you've got to pay for air refits and you'll probably want to build some hedgehogs after the 1st of August as a ban before then and you'll have to expensively restock internals if you use them and the unit that used internals survived with some of these 1RE divisions that might not be the case it's spread pretty thin you also need to notice that your tank and motorized divisions fuel as independents so they cost 1T per phase to fuel up and not like a multi-step formation um, and the final thing I'd point out is that if you lose Vitebsk, Orsha, or Mogilyov, apologies to my friend John who can pronounce Russian properly, the number of cities where you can freely train supplies is halved. So your remaining transports will have to work harder to uh, bring them forward. And that's it for thinking about supply and transport. Next up, I have a week-long face-to-face game of DAC with uh, friends, uh, which uh, I'm really looking forward to next week. I'm working on the start of a long Rule the Waves playthrough for the other major game system that I support, along with OCS and BCS. And I will be looking, I think, for the next refresher video to be on uncertainty, the fog of war, that kind of set of rules. And I'm thinking about doing a OCS why it's a great game system once I've fully immersed myself in OCS. In my mind, in my experience, it's been slightly pushed to the back because of BCS being so dynamic, but OCS is absolutely still being very actively developed and it's still a transformative game system. So I want to do something that highlights that. And then I've got a few projects that I need to finish uh, with my friend Chris. I played Balance of Powers and uh, I'm like 80% finished on that video that just needs finishing off, you know, in the usual way of things. So that's what I've got upcoming. Thanks to all these great people for helping out on this video and on previous videos where people uh, have uh, meticulously corrected my, uh, my errors. Thanks for that. Thanks for watching and look after yourself.